Um, so, <clears throat> so I'm going to chat a little bit about uh, OpenStack and uh, Linux distros, which uh, for a little while is, is actually going to sound like I'm bagging on Ubuntu. Um, and uh, but since I just told you that I'm not being negative towards people, then then it, that's going to be a wrong interpretation of the things I say. Um, anyway, uh, so in, for those of you who don't happen to know me or haven't spent a lot of time drinking with me or anything like that. Um, I should have put my name on the slide. That would be interesting. Uh, I'm Monty. Um, I'm, in case you have any background in MySQL, I'm not that Monty. I'm, I'm Monty. He's the other Monty, but this isn't a MySQL talk, so that's not nearly as funny. Um, I, uh, I was one of the people that was around when we founded OpenStack uh, back uh, in the early days and uh, set up all of the original dev infrastructure that we use for that. Uh, I am amazingly have been elected twice now to the OpenStack Foundation board, which is bizarre. Thank you, thank you. Um, and also am on the OpenStack Technical Committee, which is one of the other governing bodies uh, in OpenStack, the one that actually uh, talks about source code uh, and things like whether or not we should use Eventlet um, or, or whatnot across the project. Um, so that's uh, me and, and our, our good friend Mark McLaughlin from Rackspace, or excuse me, from Red Hat, or the uh, the lovely people who have the distinction of being on both of those bodies, which basically just means I'm in meetings all the time, uh, and I get nothing accomplished anymore. Um, so this is all I have. I have tech tech status emeritus is basically what's going on, um, and I work for HP. Uh, they are kind enough to fly me out here, uh, even though I was not kind enough to put any HP logos on my slides anywhere. Um, uh, so I, uh, uh, you know, it's probably really better for them uh, that way, um, which is where I get to the disclaimer. Uh, Anything that I'm talking about here, I'm not speaking as an emissary of HP. Uh, probably the OpenStack people would like it if I said that I'm not speaking as an emissary of OpenStack. Uh, I, I'm probably not even speaking on behalf of myself. Uh, I'm sure that something bad's going to come out. Um, but, uh, but I would like to be clear about that because I, I am, I am going to say a couple snarky things. Um, uh, and I, I don't want anybody to think that. I'd, I don't want there to be the press thing that says, HP thinks that Mark Shuttleworth is an idiot. Because um, that isn't going to go anywhere. Uh, also, that wasn't me saying that just then. Um, <laughs> gosh, this is going great. Why is that blue right there? Um, so this is the fun part. All of these slides are in, uh, this is, I'm just going to ramble because I just ate lunch. Uh, all these slides are in HTML5, uh, by the way, uh, with Slidey. Uh, so normally there isn't a big uh, blue thing right there. I wouldn't know how to make that in HTML5 if I tried. Um, I structure text. Anyway, so uh, I, I'm gonna, I might get to some of this if I stop babbling about HTML. Um, is I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of um, of OpenStack's inter interactions with uh, the Linux distros, um, uh, and then some uh, some lessons that, that we've learned from that, and then uh, in general, I want to sort of open that up a little bit at the end to some rambling thoughts about. Uh, upstreams in general, and the point of view of being of being an upstream, and and how that how that uh, affects the distro landscape, because um, uh, it's uh, it's an interesting one. Um, this is the the second project in a row that I've been on that's had some distro traction that I've been on the upstream side of the of the conversation in Ubuntu guys. So it's been really interesting. Anyway, so wow. Okay, I think what it is is that I think ah, look at that. Ah, I got rid of the blue. Uh, you can read it now. This is how good I've gotten at computers, by the way, managing people. Like this is what happens. Don't don't let it don't let it happen to you. Um, so OpenStack, uh, if uh, in case you uh, haven't heard of it, um, is some cloud software. Uh, uh, Josh McKenty gave a really great talk on that this morning in the OpenStack uh, miniconf. Um, it's uh, it's it's popular enough that it's got its own miniconf. So that's I think a certain level that one can aspire to. Um, uh, it was started basically as a joint project between Rackspace and NASA uh, a couple years ago. Possibly is it three years ago now? That's scary. Um, where, uh, where each of them were working on some cloud software uh, by themselves, decided they wanted to do this more in the open. Uh, and there's a long story there that Josh can tell you about over beer sometime because he was in the NASA side of it. Um, but I decided that, that maybe working together would be a good thing. And, and I got to say, as a note in general, for anybody starting, wanting to start a large scale open source project that you get a whole bunch of companies to participate in, getting NASA to be one of the people that you're working with is like the best way to do that ever. Because everybody thinks NASA is cool um, and 
and nobody doesn't want to join that project, right? Like, so like, you know, all of a sudden you get, you know, Red Hat and Canonical jumping on board immediately <laughs> and saying, yes, we'll play in your, in your project. And, oh, wait, I hate you guys, but, oh, never mind, NASA's cool. Um, so I, I think that actually really helped us. Uh, we've got, like, hundreds of companies involved and growing every day. There's charts and graphs, and I don't know enough about HTML. add charts and graphs to my, to my talks, so I, I just have bullet points. Um, uh, which is maybe an indication that I shouldn't use HTML for talks, but I anyway. Um, so that, that, that's sort of where it started off. But uh, but a lot of that actually, uh, the team inside of Rackspace. Rackspace was. I'm gonna. I was at Rackspace, so I'm gonna claim that, that Rackspace was a little bit more of the driver and found a partner in in NASA. Uh, I don't know if Josh from NASA would say the same thing. Um, he might think of it as that they found Rackspace. No idea. But um, but there was a set of us inside of Rackspace. Uh, that were that were working on this that were basically nothing but a combination of people who uh, used to be were current Ubuntu core members used to work for Canonical and a set of people who had up until real recently at that point in time been core developers on the drizzle fork of MySQL um, and so a lot of what goes on with OpenStack winds up being uh, a, a sort of stepchild uh, offspring of taking Drizzle and Ubuntu and squashing it together and adding folks from NASA, um, uh, and and so and that I bring that up because it, it it's it's sort of important to why we made some of the choices that that we made originally. Um, so being that most of the people that involved in putting this together actually were ex canonical employees, um, and almost all of us had interactions with things like Ubuntu Developer Summit and, and things of that nature, uh, we all thought Ubuntu was really cool. Um, so we modeled OpenStack. Exactly after Ubuntu. It's basically Ubuntu without Mark, is what OpenStack is. Um, it's what, what you have if you try and do the Ubuntu model and don't have a self-appointed benevolent dictator for any amount of time. Um, because we, we kind of try and kill those people as soon as they try and self-appoint themselves. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so we, we picked up the six-month cadence, uh, the six-month release cadence from Ubuntu. Uh, and we actually tied our releases to the, uh, to the Ubuntu release cadence. So we release two weeks before, two or three weeks before, we, we release this a couple weeks, a few weeks before their release, so that any given Ubuntu release has time to have the latest uh, release of, of OpenStack, right? And we, we made that a, a very early on, very strong strategic decision, and we have not varied from that at all. Um, that's been really, really important to us. Um, we also picked up their design summit um, model. Uh, so we get together, we get all of the OpenStack together as developers in a room every six months uh, and map out the next, uh, the next development cycle. Um, and uh, I'd actually argue that we do this better than they do at this point because them all working for one company, most of them show up at the Ubuntu Developer Summit already having mapped out their six months and this is sort of where they're going to do it, they're going to talk about it in public, but the decisions have already been made. We all just like yelling at each other in OpenStack, so we get together and actually have the discussion there at the design summit and make decisions in the room, which is actually fun. And then we go out and drink massively. So if you if you like drinking, or if you like cloud software, um, or you, either one, uh, you should come to an OpenStack design summit at some point, and um, there will be large companies who will try and uh, buy your love by giving you free alcohol. Um, so, you know, I, that's, that's my pitch for coming to that. And, and if you contribute to OpenStack, you get a free uh, entry pass to that. So that's one of, the, one of the nice things. So you should definitely come contribute to OpenStack. We'll give you free alcohol. Um, gosh, that just sounds like we're drunks. Um, I guess we are. Um, anyway, uh, so we picked, up, um, we picked up versioning scheme stuff from, from Ubuntu, right? So they, they have, a, they have a, a, a version they're building towards. Like right now, they're building Raring ring tail. Um, and it has both a, a code name and it has a version. Uh, so it's going to be what? 13.04 uh, and is also called Raring. Um, so we decided to do the same thing. Why not? Let's have alphabetically increasing uh, release names and also have date-based date, date based num numeric release strings except that they're in our case not quite what you'd expect from the... I don't have... I was then not in the room when we decided that the second tuple, the second set of numbers in our version string would not be the month, even though you would think looking at it that it was, if it's 2013.01, that that might be something we released in January. But no, it's the first thing that we released in 2013. Go figure. So it's really difficult to know <laughs> beforehand what it is you're going to be releasing from a software perspective. But we picked that up because we thought that was a good idea. Uh, we're currently working on Grizzly, uh, which will be 2013.1. Um, 
and then also in in pre-release things, uh, we we use Debian sort of tildes for for to indicate that this this thing that we just this tarball we just published is a thing working towards twenty so twenty thirteen dot one tilde m one tilde something 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 is a thing working towards the milestone one of twenty thirteen which itself is the thing working towards twenty thirteen dot one um, theory. Karez, the release manager, is really the only person that fully understood that, that versioning scheme. Well, him and I, because I actually implemented the code to implement it. Um, but the two of us, the to be versioned, people like, I have no idea what that means. We're like, really? It's really simple. You just, anyway. Um, so we picked that up from Ubuntu. Um, we also, even though the two main projects, <laughs> this, is, this is how corporations get involved in getting involved in open source software can go bad. Uh, there was a set of us that were putting together this marriage of, of some different software projects. The two software projects themselves, Nova and Swift, were happily using GitHub to do all of the, and Git to do all of their development. And we sure did make them switch to BZR and Launchpad because we were Ubuntu people. Um, that had some. That had some fun repercussions. Uh, we'll get back to that. Uh, so we did that. I mean, we, we went full bore into trying to be Ubuntu. Um, and then from Drizzle, we picked up the idea of a gated trunk, which if you came to the CI mini-conf yesterday, you will have heard every single person who talked mention something about liking gated trunks. Um, uh, anyway, so, and the brief word about, the brief word about that is that the idea of the gated trunk is that we'll have automation between the developer and actually pushing code up. So no developer actually pushes code into the, uh, into the OpenSAC repositories. They put up code for code review, and there are systems that, after it's been reviewed, will test it. And if it's tested properly, then the system will, will land it. Right? That's, that's the thing that we mean when we talk about gated trunks. Um, and it's, it's been a really key. We've, of the things I can say positive and negative about OpenStack, all of our repos have been fully gated since commit one into the, into the repo, and we have with one exception, uh, never had a human override a push uh, into, a, into a repo, um, which is sort of neat. Uh, and that one, we could have beer and I'll tell you all about that, but it involved lots of talking. <laughs> um, anyway, so because we, were, because we were so tied to Ubuntu and because so many of us had the Ubuntu background, um, or, or just distro backgrounds in general, um, we, we made one, an, an early decision, I should have mentioned this slide, uh, that we decided, uh, I'll go back and edit the slide uh, later. Um, also, we decided that we were going to, to target our development only at the latest Ubuntu release. Um, basically just said, you know what? Uh, we could support Fedora and Ubuntu and Debian and old Fedora and SUSE and you know, Gen 2 and whatever, but that's hard. Uh, and nobody uses anything except Ubuntu anyway. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just focus on that. And, um, and then other people, if they want, because that's sort of what we're doing right now. And we'll figure out the rest later. You know, that just, but for dev purposes, make sure that we always focus on that. It was a key thing. So because of that, we, um, we made the rule that anything that any of our software depended on had to be available in, a, in, in the distro, right? So um, we actually had, um, we had a, a, a PPA in Launchpad that was a, a, an archive where we, we kept collections of depends that hadn't made it into uh, the Ubuntu archive yet. Um, and uh, and then on our on our build slaves where we're doing our testing, we actually install the software on those purely by doing app get build dep on the on the software project in in uh, uh, in question. So if we were working on Nova on a Nova build slave, it'd run app get build dep Nova, um, which would grab all of the build dependencies that were listed in the in the in the file. This had the because we're like, hey, we already listed these in the in the Debian packaging. Why would we list them anywhere else, right? Like that's duplication. Um, turns out that's, um, I'll come back to that. It turns out that doesn't work very well um, uh, as a process, but, uh, but that was the idea, right? That we would, we would make sure that whatever we were doing would be friendly to our fine friends uh, at Ubuntu um, so that we would be in, uh, in, in good place to be, because at this point we were a project that existed for like a week, you know? So we're like, we want people to use us. We should probably be in the distros. We should be friendly. Um, and then we, and we kept also PPAs for, uh, for publishing the packages. So whenever a commit would land, we'd publish a package into, uh, into the PPA so that you could actually follow. In the theory was, you should be able to just app get install Nova having added our PPA and follow trunk, essentially, if you wanted to. In practice, that didn't really work because we didn't have any testing of upgrades uh, or installs, but um, <laughs> you know, that was the idea. Uh, distros packages will make everything better. Um, 
this ha this approach had a couple of problems. Um, one of them was that adding a new dependency for a developer, if they're like, oh, I need a new version of whatever, I want to add this new Python library that we're going to use in here, uh, meant they actually had to go to the Debian packaging uh, tree itself, and they had to add the build depend there, which is actually sort of erroneous, because the thing that that was packaging didn't actually depend on that version yet, because the, the the patch that landed in, to land in the tree that would add the need for that new dependency hadn't landed in the tree yet. But they had to add that into the packaging so that a package would be produced and be put in the PVA so that we could update the build dependencies using app get build up on the, on the build slave um, so that we could then test to see if their change that needed the new dependency would work. Um, if that seems confusing, uh, it is. Uh, and it didn't work for anybody. Um, and so at the point where we had like 60, 70 developers running around, there were like three of us who knew how to actually update the dependencies of the project. Um, and then we would often like Soren was in was in Europe, and I was you know passed out somewhere in the corner. And people would go like they'd try and figure out how to do it, and we'd be like, oh, it's easy. You just edit the Debian control file, and they'd all just start sobbing. Um, and, and they weren't happy. So that was, that was sort of an issue. Um, the other thing is that these are all Python projects. I might have should have mentioned that earlier. OpenStack is all written purely in Python. Um, so Python already has a way of listing dependencies on other Python packages. Um, and those were already actually in the tree because a lot of the developers were using Python virtual environments in their dev environment. So they kept a list of things they could use to just download things from PyPy and solve them and work that way. So a lot of times we'd have a developer write a patch add the depend to the, the requirements list inside of the Python tree, and they would wonder why the build wouldn't work. Um, because we were having new developers in all day long, and they, didn't, they weren't getting up to speed on um, Ubuntu culture. Um, uh, and so that was, that was also a bit problematic. Also, I don't know if you guys have noticed this or not, but stable releases of distros don't change very often. Um, once, for instance, Precise is released, they don't really just put new software in it because then it wouldn't be a stable release of a distro anymore. Um, so when you're doing heavy early stage development on a project, um, you're likely to find some things that aren't in the distro yet. So we had to keep our own, uh, our own repository of backported fixes of things so that we could install them so that, because they hadn't, they hadn't hit upstream yet, right? Uh, upstream from the distro. So, so we had like, we were starting to carry what was seeming like a sub-distro itself. It wasn't, we weren't curating it in that way, but by de facto, as, since we were delivering Nova Debs in an app repository with a whole bunch of backported packages, I mean, guess what we were delivering somebody? It was a special purpose distribution. Um, and, uh, and that has some, some concerns like security concerns and how do you deal with bugs and you know what's the person's update and like because you can tell somebody all day long don't run your production off of this off of this archive and then, <laughs> as soon as the archive exists somebody is installing that thing in production like that's just that's just how it works um, so anyway so these are all some some pain points that we hit with that however as pain point as that was uh, we actually lasted that way for doing that for about a year. Uh, we had a couple of different OpenStack releases. We had a couple of different meetups around the, around the thing, planning next things. It mostly worked, because even though it's a pain to add a new dependency, it turns out you don't actually add new dependencies to your software daily. Um, it's, it's one of those things that even if it sucks as a process, you can, you can live with it. Um, over that period of time, Ubuntu also dropped Eucalyptus in their Ubuntu Cloud product for OpenStack. Woo, we won. Um, turns out Eucalyptus is you know Java and weird. Um, uh, and also Open Core, which is a whole other thing. But I'm not here to bag on Morton Mikos' new company. Um, however, uh, oh, I don't think there's two Ds in foreshadowing. Um, eh, well, we discovered yesterday that my, my uh, HTML uh, presentation thing doesn't have a spell checker, because it's VI. Um, uh, is, has a spell what's that? It's Vim. I have Vim, but I, I don't, I'm mostly hacking Python code, so I just don't have it turned on. I mean, yeah, that's a good idea. I should figure out how that works. Um, no, that's great. I should spell check NVI more often. <laughs> should spell check my Python code. Um, it might think that some of the, anyway. Uh, I don't think any of the keywords are misspellings. That should actually probably just do the right thing, shouldn't it? Maybe not for like, anyway. Um, I, 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 no, no, it's HTML. But I edited it in a, anyway, yeah, we're, this is, 
I'm tangenting on this for some reason today, and I don't know why. Um, so um, there's some things that, are, that are, I'm going to cover here in a second, but um, there's a couple things that happened over over the course of, of this period of time that, as I'm telling a story of the history of how we got somewhere, I'm going to have to admit that I don't remember when they happened. <laughs> so this is the slide that covers them. Um, and uh, it is somewhere around this and the next sort of main things that happened, uh, which is that um, because of the pain points of, of updating the packages, we moved from, we dropped the idea of using uh, packages to build our Jenkins slaves. We actually, what happened is we, we started adding more projects. We, we started off with two projects, Nova and, and Swift. But then we added Glance and we added a project called Burrow, which isn't there anymore. Uh, and then we added this project called Keystone. And all of a sudden, rather than just having two different slave profiles to do builds, we we're starting to have four, and we we're starting to have more than people writing client libraries, and it was starting to get ridiculous. Um, and so we made the decision as a project to give up, uh, to give up on using packages as a primary mean for us to satisfy our build dependencies for our developers. Also, it turns out, sadly enough, some of our developers are idiots and run Mac. Um, right? And so the fact that we had a PPA uh, with, with dependency packages on it, they'd be like, I don't know how to get that on my Mac because it doesn't work well. Um, uh, they don't have packages on Macs, apparently. Um, but nonetheless, they were, you know, they were our developers um, and we have to deal with them. So we moved to, um, to actually taking the model that the developers were using already and using Python virtual environments um, to satisfy developers' needs. <coughs> And therefore, also the, the, the needs of the of the system for, for testing for the the software we were producing um, via uh, via the Python packages and PyPy uh, and using virtual environments for that, um, which uh, which which brings us to to sort of a thing um, that that was all related to to sort of a fundamental disconnect we were starting to have with our with our, our fine friends at, at Ubuntu, which is that as an upstream. We have a specific care, which is that, that we want our software, the latest commit of our software, to work on the stable releases of the distros. They want the latest stable release from us. They want to work on pack packaging that for the upcoming release of their distro. So the things we're doing actually, we're actually not working on the same problem. It's really similar. Right? The packaging work most of the time is the same thing, but the output is actually for a different matrix of things. Um, right? The guys at Ubuntu right now are working on software for raring. I can't install raring because it's, it's like super pre-release alpha, something like that. I'm not going to set all my build slaves and my laptop to run raring so I can do development work on it. I'm going to work on their most recent release, Quantal, and I'm going to work on tip of my trunk. They're also not working on tip of my trunk. They're working on the last thing that I released three months ago. Um, and so, so part, of, part of some of the issues that, that we started to have with, with Ubuntu was because of this, this disconnect. We'd be trying to edit packaging, uh, the packaging trees. We're trying, to keep a, <laughs> we're trying to keep a packaging tree, right? We're trying to keep a single Nova packaging tree that they and we could collaborate on, right? Um, and, and then things would happen like, oh, hey, the DH Python migration inside of Debian was run in the most insane manner possible. Um, and it made it so that you couldn't have a single rules file that worked out of the box on multiple releases. Because again, they're focusing on their upcoming release of the, of the thing. They're not focusing on backporting, making things source back portable with no modifications to older releases of the, of the distro, because why would they? That's a, so I say it's a stupid way to run the migration, but it's actually not a, it's not a problem case for, for them, right? But for me, making packages for older things, I want to do a package for Lucid. Well, I'd like for the packaging to work on both because it's kind of the same packaging. Anyway, um, so we had, we had problems like that. Um, and then things got worse. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you know this or not, but, but, but BZR and Launchpad are a bit of a pet project for, for Ubuntu. Uh, they like them. Um, I've got one of the former uh, BZR devs on my team right now, and he did a really great job with it. And I liked using it for a while, but our developers eventually revolted against our top-down decision that the project should use uh, BZR originally. Uh, and thus it was decided that we would move back to Git. Um, yay! Yeah. And actually, I can tell lots of stories about why that's actually wound up being way better. Um, I'm, I have, I've, I'm a full-on convert at this point, uh, so I will admit I was wrong. Um, this almost never happens, so enjoy it. Um, but, uh, 
But, so we, we, moved, we moved to Git. We installed a Garrett server, which is what we use to do our, our code review. It's fantastic. Um, and, and also around this time, uh, we started being able, we started looking at doing actually, most of the testing we've been doing in our gate up until this point was unit tests, right? It was just running in code unit tests, which you don't actually have to install something to be able to test. But we were getting to the point where people were trying to start actually using our software in production, and they were unhappy that it didn't work. Um, so we figured that maybe what we should do is we should start adding some integration testing where we would actually install the software and then test the results of that. Uh, woo, magical. Um, which is all reasonable things to do. Um, and in our, in, our, in our thoughts of how to do that, it's, it goes like this. Hey, I've got a commit. I'm going to create some packages from it, right? I'm going to, I'm going to get a new blank machine. I'm going to apt-get install those packages on the new blank machine. Uh, and then I'll have a cloud on it, right? And then I'll test it. And that'll be neat. And it'll be easy. <laughs> um, except that our, our, the thing that we were using for, for package maintenance at this point was Launchpad's PPA feature, which is asynchronous. Um, you push source packages up to the PPA and you wait. And eventually, it builds them because it's a free community service. Thank you for providing that. But it's asynchronous, which makes it really hard to put into something that's gating a developer's commit from landing in your tree. Um, also, I don't know if you mentioned, remember on that last slide when I mentioned that we moved to Git, um, well, the launch, the Ubuntu people really like keeping all of their packaging stuff in Bazaar. Um, and so they wanted to keep their packaging branches in Bazaar, which meant that all of a sudden our developers had two different uh, uh, two different areas that they had to, to work in. Um, and then the thing I was talking about just a couple slides ago, the multi-release packaging patches, we actually had pushback from things where we were putting in code with some ifs and some conditionals and stuff like that into the Debian rules file in the packaging that were getting rejected because they're like, this patch is for adding support for an old release of Ubuntu and we don't, we don't think that it's necessary to have that in there. And we're like, we can't build packages without it. And they're like, oh, you could just have another branch for for the, old, for the old packaging. I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. Um, or I could put an if in this one file and then I don't have to have two branches of packaging. So there got to be some words that were said. Um, in any case, so, so then I wrote this really nice long email uh, to the OpenSag dev mailing list uh, where I suggested, hey, check it out. There's this thing called git build package. Um, it's pretty neat. Uh, we could take the packaging branches we're currently working on uh, collaboratively and we could put them where we work on all the rest of the software collaboratively in our code review system. Um, this has, them, has the benefit of everyone every can now work together on these, on these branches and that would be great. Um, also, when we started, it was like me working half time on developer infrastructure. At this point, we were already running like eight different servers and had elastic build farms of build slaves. I'm like, I don't really need your asynchronous building Debian packages isn't that hard. Uh, I've got a build farm. How about I just build the packages and publish them into an app repo myself? Uh, that'll take me like a day. Um, and, uh, and then we can also, with that, we can support a big matrix of outputs and we can have packages for Lucid and for Maverick and for all of these different things and on every commit I can produce all of them and we can have them right there. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Um, so my manager got a phone call. <laughs> um, and then I got a phone call from him. Uh, and he's like, yeah, Ubuntu guys just called us and we're like screaming and like they're really unhappy um, that you suggested, uh, you suggested these terrible, terrible things. All of their, you know, they're great and you're terrible and all like that. Um, and I, I mainly laughed, but, um, but I, I took, the, I took the, the, the proposal off the table. Um, although it's still in my, my back pocket and I like referencing it from time to time when people get a little bit ornery. Um, but we, I got that. So, um, so anyway, so we tabled it for a second and then we had our, uh, our Essex um, uh, Design Summit, uh, which was in Boston a year and a half ago. Um, and, um, and at that point, we, we sat down in the room with, with the guys from Ubuntu. And at this point, Red Hat had started actually showing up and, and, and doing a whole bunch of work. Uh, and they're doing a great job. I'd like to, I'd like to really give them props for that. Uh, and we had a meeting, and they, were bas they both basically said, hey, you know what? All of this tension we're having between how the packages get made, how about you guys just stop? Um, you guys be an upstream, and will be a distro, 
and we'll package your software, and you just make tarballs, right? And we'll consume them and package them. And I was like, awesome. <laughs> it's so much less work for me. Um, uh, so that request happened, and around the same time, the guys at Rackspace released this tool called DevStack, um, which was a tool that is, um, for a similar reason, we had, and I didn't go into it in this, but we had similar types of issues with everybody in the world wanting to use Chef or Puppet to install, figure out how to install, and we want, of course, to test that. Except that you can't get the Chef people to agree with the Puppet people, or the Puppet people to agree with the Chef people. Um, and you couldn't pick one, because if you picked one, then the other people would get really angry. Um, uh, which is sort of part of the distro problem, and probably a reason we should have. We were trying to avoid that by just supporting one. Anyway, none of that worked. Um, but they released this thing which basically just punted on the, on the entire idea of having a config management based install of OpenStack for testing, and it's just a shell script. Um, and it's like, hey, here's a big shell script with comments, it's readable, uh, use that and installs. And we said, okay, cool, we'll use that <laughs> to do integration testing. We'll spin up a VM and we'll use your dev stack thing to just grab the Python code itself and just install it because it's Python. It takes like three seconds to install, it's not hard. Um, I mean, it's hard to install OpenStack, it's very hard, it'll take you days. But, um, but Python itself is really easy to just run and install, it's not, you know, it's not a difficult thing. Um, so between the two of those, um, we, 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 uh, to extrapolate sort of sort of what happened from that is is a the, the main lesson of this that we had is hey man be an upstream right like don't try and be the upstream that's also the distribution that's also the thing we got these distros out there right they're actually pretty good at their job um, and before you can before you can be there's a there's a reason that the the, the packaging best practices for for both Red Hat and, and Debian talk a lot about having different different roles in your in, in your world you've got you get the role of producing the software, and then it's it's a tarball, right? And then, or I guess you could do it in a zip file, but you'd be weird. Um, but making making a source archive of that, and then the act of packaging is it has its own revision numbers on top of it, and, and everything like that. Um, so anyway, so the way that we can actually be a better citizen um, in in this sort of multi-distro, uh, this newly multi-distro, now that Red Hat had joined the the, the conversation, um, but even even just with the the one distro was. Um, just, just actually behave like an upstream software project. Don't, don't try and do our work for us. So I was like, great, awesome. Um, and the other one um, is sort of latent in here, but I thought since I'm doing a lessons learned side, uh, I'd, I'd go ahead and say, uh, actually make releases. Because uh, there's a lot of people out there who think that Git archives off of GitHub is an appropriate way to release software, and it's not. Um, if you think that you're wrong, um, and if you still think that you're right and I'm wrong, even though I just told you you're wrong, Find me and we'll have a beer and I'll tell you all about it. But um, it, it, it's, anyway, make a release because then the people who are releasing, who are just packaging your software for distros can actually put it in their distro. It, it, it may be hard, it's not hard. Um, anyway, so do that. So um, since then, I, so that, that, sort of, that sort of got us to the point where we are now, which where we're using no distro package. We have basically no distro footprint at all. Um, inside of our development environment. Um, we still develop on Ubuntu Latest in our dev farm, but it's all done via Python packages, so it's kind of irrelevant. Um, since then, Red Hat has shown up with a lot of devs. They have been doing, it turns out, free software for a long time. Uh, and when they decide to get involved in a project, they bring developers to, <laughs> to the table and have them work on the code uh, in, in the upstream project. Um, the same time, Ubuntu has added a bunch of CI testing in their own data centers, um, on their own, sort of privately. Um, you might be seeing a... Anyway, um, so that's happened. Uh, we, we actually just recently, like I'm, when I say just recently, I mean like two weeks ago, uh, we've dropped our use of Debian pre-versioning for things because the, the... So the next thing we realized, when I said about being, a, being an upstream and making releases, um, on one of those first slides, I mentioned that we had a six month release process, right? Six months release cadence. That means that we've decided that we're gonna release the software every six months. For convenience for testing, we were making installable Debian packages so that we could, so that we could do the testing, which meant that we were effectively making a rolling, a rolling release cycle that was, that was releasing every, we were effectively releasing every commit to trunk. Um, even though we weren't designed as a project to be a rolling released project. Um, once we stopped making packages, we kept making tarballs that were versioned so that somebody could make packages that were suitable for use as a rolling release. 
Except, like I said, we, that's not what our release model is. That's just, that's just a build artifact from the past, from when we were also trying to be a rolling distribution. Um, so, so we got rid of it a couple weeks ago. We were like, hey, we're, it, it turns out it's actually really hard to automatically generate tarballs that version themselves towards a release that you don't know what it is from the context of the repository. We had, we solved it. I mean, it was, we had a, there was a lot of infrastructure just to deal with like weird shadow get branches with like metadata in them and stuff like that. It's like, and then like some of the other districts, I believe it was SUSE that came in and were like, uh, we're trying to build packages and your thing keeps trying to access git in part of its install. And we don't, we don't have access to that right now and we don't know what to do. And we're like, that's okay. Um, sorry. Uh, you're right, that's, that's entirely too complicated. <laughs> Let's get rid of that. Um, so we dropped that. Uh, so now we don't produce per commit tarballs that are named anything other than the name of the project and then the name of the branch. So we have a nova-master.tar.gz that gets overwritten every, every commit. If you want to pull the latest tarball, you can pull it. I'm, not, I'm clearly not indicating to you that it is a release of anything. It's, it's a rolling tarball. If you think that it's anything other than rolling tarball, you are drastically mistaken. Uh, and it's, your, it's clearly your fault uh, in that case. Um, uh, we, we've, Red Hat has come in and we've actually started adding rel, uh, direct rel testing support. Um, and then another thing that I'd like to suggest before I go on to the next uh, bout of rambling, which I might be running out of time, but um, is uh, for those of you who know Lifeless, uh, Robert Collins is here at the, the conference. He's giving a talk on Friday about a thing called Triple O. Um, which is uh, and and and, and uh, some technology we've been working on called Disk Image Builder. Uh, I was going to say, ch chat with him at some point. Uh, there's some there's some interesting directions that we're that we're trying to take. Um, the idea of how we deal with uh, uh, package dependencies in a world where we're Python. But um, I want to come back to the upstream viewpoint, right? Uh, and I talked about this just a little bit, but. Um, there's a there's sort of a there's sort of a I think right now there's sort of a missing piece uh, in the in the software delivery uh, story, which is that it, it's taking care of the of the viewpoint that I, I was talking about earlier. Is that as an upstream, I care about delivering to you the latest version of my software, and I would like to deliver it on a on a stable platform. Um, so I want you to run OpenStack tip on. Ubuntu Precise, or on the latest stable release of, of Debian, or on the latest RHEL, right? Um, and it turns out a lot of users running things in production want the same thing. On their MySQL server, they don't care what version of MySQL might have happened to have been in Ubuntu when Ubuntu was released. They want the Ubuntu there because they want security updates on everything that isn't MySQL that's on their system, like the dbus daemon that apparently is in server images now because dbus is definitely something we need in servers but um but so clearly somebody needs to manage those security updates but but for the the task that thing is performing if they're running a production mysql service they're probably going to be using a more recent mysql than what is, than what's in the distro right that's the important thing and this model i think is is entirely and it's, it's something that you, you really notice as an upstream is there's really no good way for you to deliver what you're trying, the thing that, that's important to you. I know the Cassandra guys had the same, like when, when Ubuntu was talking about, about packaging Cassandra, the Cassandra guy was like, no, don't even add us to the distro. Because all that's going to happen is you're going to have some six month old version of Cassandra, and all of a sudden we're going to be getting questions on the mailing list about how to fix a bug in something that we haven't even paid attention to in six months. Uh, we don't, we don't want to support that. Uh, the Swift guys inside of Nova as well. They do really, They don't have stable. They don't have old stable releases. They just do rolling up. They do new releases that are backwards compatible. They don't want to support code that they wrote six months ago because they've already fixed it. Um, and and it's just it's a it's a different model um, that I think we have a problem with there. Um, so much so that Ubuntu agrees with me. Um, they have. Uh, people don't want to run old OpenStack so much because it's a really fast moving target that Ubuntu has, and I say canonical slash Ubuntu because we were, we, were, we were at the last Ubuntu Developer Summit and somebody asked the question, I thought it was a really good one, is whether the new Ubuntu Cloud Archive was an Ubuntu project or a canonical project, and the answer was yes. Um, actually, I believe the, the answer was that it's intended to be an Ubuntu project. But it didn't really go through the Ubuntu Tech Committee's blessing to add as a new Ubuntu project. 
What? <laughs> yeah, right? Um, so it's, it's possible. It's possible that the line between Ubuntu and Canonical might be blurry. Uh, <laughs> but someone in the, in, in the collection of the canonical Ubuntu world uh, decided to act quite rightly. Actually, the thing is, is that I'm going to pick on them for doing it the wrong way, but they made the right decision, which is they made an archive that what they're, what they're, what they're uh, saying they're going to offer is latest OpenStack on previous releases of, so it's a special backports archive just for OpenStack. So you as a person who wants to run OpenStack can add the Ubuntu Cloud Archive and you can run the latest, whatever the latest thing is on the latest Ubuntu LTS. And they're gonna do that from this, like for the life cycle of the LTS release. So for five years or whatever, every six months when we release a new OpenStack, they're gonna backport that to their to their latest LTS and put that in the Ubuntu Cloud Archive, as well as all of the surrounding things that have to be done, right? Yeah, it's fantastic. Good job, guys. Turns out they've discovered that a lot of those things I was complaining about, about the matrix of support you had to do to do that, uh, it's a hard problem. Um, and they've been like, oh, now we've got to deal with, oh, crap. I'm like, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, we had that conversation when you told me I was thinking about it too hard. Um, uh, but that's great, because it, it, it is matrix support, and this is what they're there for. They're, they're a distribution, they're there to support this. They do have the knowledge and the, and the tools to do it, but it's a completely different model. This is a, this is a really, really new thing for a distribution to do, because uh, it's basically it's the opposite of, of what, the, what the distro release model is. Um, and, and they don't really have the specific governance for it, which is why I think that Canonical sort of have to do it and then be like, okay, well, we're gonna staff it, so you know, we'll make sure it works. Um, when I was talking earlier, this gets us to this weird thing, right? OpenStack is sort of a big deal right now, so we, we get special cased in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, but when I was talking earlier about us having a PPA, which itself was, was becoming a de facto distribution, um, I think that's not just us. I think that every time anybody with a piece of software has a PPA with their piece of software in it and anything else other than just their piece of software, or even not, maybe just their software, that's becoming its own de facto distribution, right? Because if you test that piece of software and it works, that's cool. What about all the libraries it depends on, right? Every single Python library that OpenStack uses directly or indirectly might as well be in the OpenStack tree. Um, because when we test OpenStack and we say this works, we really are only saying that it works with this specific set of of library dependencies, right? So each application themselves winds up being a de facto distribution, which is weird. Um, and we don't really, I don't think, have a good model for that uh, in, an out, in an out of band of distro release model, right? In the distro, it's fine because upgrades, updates to, this is one of the reasons they don't put new <coughs> software releases in stable releases of a distro, other than carefully curated bug fixes is because it is all interdependent and they've got to be able to verify that and that's the value that you get out of running a stable distro release. Um, uh, but, but with all of, all of the bearded Ruby hackers running around, we're, we're, getting more and more, um, uh, we're getting more and more things that are moving quicker. And, uh, and it's really important to notice that I am talking about dependent debt uh, libraries, um, which is just the worst misspelling on a slide I think I've ever done. Um, the other thing that comes into this, and I, I believe I'm over time at this point, um, uh, is, is, the, is the idea of all of the, all of the arguments and, and discussions we have around language-centric packaging. If you ever follow any of, the, any of the distro conversations about what to do about Ruby or, or Java, the same thing applies to Perl and Python. The Perl and Python people just have, have had longer to figure out how to integrate with the, the distro as well. Um, but the Java guys care about Maven releases of their Java stuff. They actually, it's not a value add to them to be in the distro because they've already got an app distribution model that works for them. Same thing with the Ruby guys. Um, and I think that's the thing that we've got to solve. So anyway, this is more me now spouting. Um, we've been talking about images. I'll get you to talk to Robert Collins about that. Um, the, the sort of leaving questions that, that a lot of this has gotten me to think about recently is, um, especially as a, as a long-term distro supporter, um, is, is what, if, what if the distro really only was there for core things? For the longest time, it's been the idea that everything should go in the distro. What if that wasn't the case? Um, what if it was only there for core things? What if the distro packaging was really only there for things that needed a C compiler, right? Because it's really good at doing that. Also, C is really bad at packaging itself. Um, and that's what, those, all, that's what most of those package management things were designed to deal with, is C shared libraries. They're not really designed to deal with Ruby. 
Um, nothing is designed to deal with Ruby. I mean, let's be honest. But um, you know, uh, or or what if our pack? What if we what if we expanded our worldview to to actually play nice with Python or the other ones? I don't really care about them, but you know, I guess I'll list them there. Um, or then people talking about things as what if what if each installed ran on in its own container VM. These are all. If I hadn't babbled so much, we could talk about those more. But um, anyway, uh, that's pretty much what I've got for right now. And talking about what we did, uh, all these slides are online. Um, uh, all of the <laughs> You can tell I stole that slide from a different presentation. Um, all the repos I talked about this are in the OpenStack infrastructure uh, 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 org and GitHub, which is not true because I didn't talk about any repos. Um, but the next line is true, which is that uh, if you go to OpenStack CI, github.com slash publications, uh, all of these, uh, this and all of the other uh, slide decks that uh, are talks that any of us in the OpenStack infrastructure team do are, are there. Uh, and you can fork them if you want to. I don't know why you'd want to do that. Anyway. Uh, how, how badly over time am I? Do we or questions? No. You still have two minutes. I have two minutes. Wow. Oh my God. Like it's my thing's been telling me that. Are there any questions? Anything I can babble about meaninglessly? Yes. Uh, I mean, you sort of alluded to this when you mentioned that they're getting a bad way of backporting to, to stable releases. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that everybody who's doing in the language out of band packaging ish is running into is that the distros aren't keeping up. I mean, the only language that is packaged to CPAN is quite low. Uh, that was just a springboard to what I want to ask you. Is that, I mean, the problem that I mean, all communities run into for, for a long time is not having a direct relationship with its users. Yeah. The distros are frankly in the way. Yeah. And uh, are not helping. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, as a long time Linux distro guy, this is a bit of a shock. <laughs> I'm also on that upstream, and, and it's it's a weird evolution. And so it's it's, it's interesting. So you guys are grappling with exactly the same issues and. Kind of really, we just like to ship it. Thanks. So our users just want it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Monty, can you repeat the question? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize that. I'm not gonna repeat all that. Basically, um, the 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 overall thing was uh, in talking about sort of out of band packaging and stuff like that. Um, that you you have uh, referencing sort of GNOME and and their interest also in just being able to have a direct relationship uh, to the users because in a lot of ways the distros. Aren't keeping up um, in that, and 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 sort of interesting that 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 OpenStack seeing the same uh, the same situation. And I, I I agree. I don't, I don't have a great specific solution unless unless we went to like some of the some of these questions of maybe we scale back what the what the scope of the distro is because I think that also a lot of the distros came about in a time when the when the when the one's ability to both do packaging and also to distribute things to people was vastly different. I mean, has anybody noticed that we still, that there's still public mirrors of the MySQL repositories? Um, has anybody noticed that Oracle is a big company that, why are there mirrors of the MySQL downloads, right? Why are people donating mirrored resources? It's because we've been doing it for 20 years and we haven't thought to stop. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know, but maybe, maybe we, it, maybe it is time to rethink how that works other than the fact that there's some, you know, billionaires running around with, you know, Agendas. Um, it's sort of a thing. At least once in a conference, I have to make a dig at Shuttleworth. So um, we've at least gotten that in for this conference for today. Uh, anything else? No. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Monty.